Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight. We want to give you a couple of prayer requests before we get started and a little bit of information. Crystal is going to be having surgery tomorrow, so we're we'll praying for her that that goes well and that she Who's is having surgery. Crystal oh. is having surgery tomorrow, and so please be praying for her that it goes well. She won't be with us for a few weeks after that as she recovers, so just pray for the whole process. Um, Karen asked us to pray for Baby Reed. Baby Reed got a cold at the pediatrician's. Oh, they're pretty sure that's where. And it's been challenging because, as you all know, very small babies when they're sick, it's almost the hardest thing in the world to look at. <laughs> and so mom is struggling too. So be praying for both their healing and just the peace in the time while it's happening. Um, Leah is not with us tonight. It's just for some personal stuff. So if she, if her group, if you're in Leah's group, please feel free to join any group that you want to. Okay? We're going to just let you spread across, or you can all go to the same group. It's whatever you prefer. And we are, and Sandy is going to leave after teaching because she's not feeling the best. You probably don't want to get right up on her. But she is, she has been struggling all day, but she is determined to do what God has for her to do tonight and she wants to teach so we are grateful to be able to be here for that so let's pray and get started father thank you so very much for women of God thank you for women who love you for women who honor you and for women who choose you every day father I pray that you would bless Sandy as she teaches I pray that you give her all the strength that she needs that she'd have clarity and wisdom and just be able to to Share with us everything that you put on her heart. I pray for Leah at home that you just take care of her. I pray for Crystal as she gets ready to have surgery tomorrow, Father. I pray that you'd be with the doctors and that every single thing would go exactly correctly. That her healing would be swift and complete. And Father, I thank you for every one of these ladies that you brought in here tonight. I pray that you would do the work that you have designed from the beginning of time to do tonight, that we would be different going home and living out your life in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, hi guys. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'll just tell you when I called David Hammonds and asked for a stool and a microphone, he told me I sounded like Jerry White. <laughs> Can't do enough, I really don't. <laughs> but anyway, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I went to urgent care on Saturday. So I'm staying distant because I'm not sure. And I got, I'm going to leave because I'm not feeling good. But this lesson tonight um, is critical for all of us, especially me. Um, we're now in our 12th week together. Can you believe it's been 12 weeks? but it's barely enough time to scratch the surface. But we will continue scratching, and prayerfully tonight, we will be enabled to dig just a little bit deeper into the very reason that Paul wrote this letter to his beloved Galatians. <clears throat> this all-consuming passion he had for them, that his readers would understand the truth of the message of the gospel of grace, that salvation is a gift, of his grace and that being justified happens solely by grace through faith and not of works as the Ephesians 2 8 and 9 says by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourself it's the gift of God not as a result of works so that no one can boast and when we have been saved by his grace through faith and we are then called to continue by faith it's absolutely foolish to think that we can continue apart from faith and grow by our own works. Remember Paul's bang on the head to the Galatians? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And chapter 5 began by emphasizing our calling to freedom freely granted by the Spirit through Christ. For it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. 
And last week we discussed how trying to keep the law is like putting on a leash, a leash that's meant to keep a child who doesn't have the good sense to stay close to his parents protected. But as we grow in our walk with him, we're called to stand firm in the freedom we have and we are to refuse to put that leash back on, but we are called rather to come to Jesus and rest in what only he can do. He said, come to me. If Jesus said, come to me, he meant, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, works weary us and heavy laden us, but Jesus gives us rest and he calls us to take his yoke upon us and then to learn from him. To learn from him because he's exactly who we, how we need to be in order to not go back to the works of the flesh. But his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And Jesus actually modeled this for us as he took upon himself the yoke of his father. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does these things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus freely wore his Father's yoke. He willingly took on the position of a servant, and he served his Father. And we are to have this attitude in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus freely came as a servant of the Father, and we are to have that same attitude. We're called to freedom, to willingly live our lives as servants to our Father, not by the works of the law, but by his grace through faith. But sometimes, let's be honest, living by his grace through faith really leaves us scratching our heads, wondering how. I'm not the only one, am I? No. Paul had expounded on this calling, repeatedly emphasizing that God calls us away from following rules in order to follow him in relationship. <clears throat> he calls us to come away from our own works and to come to rest in him in his way of grace. Uh -oh. <coughs> I'm sorry. Well, <clears throat> then he calls us to stop the futility of trying to obey by the power of the flesh. We are to obey by the power of the Holy Spirit. And tonight, <clears throat> we're going to do our best to consider our calling to live <clears throat> by His grace that works as, it, as, he yield, as we yield to His Spirit. <clears throat> Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to try not to project so much because <clears throat> I'm so sorry. So, but again, we ask, how? This was no easy lesson to prepare. So to begin with, let me say that I often find myself in that boat, wondering how. How do I live by faith? How do I yield to his Holy Spirit? So in my little pea brain, and it is a little pea brain, I was reminded of a human illustration. It's like the difference between the stop sign and the yield sign. Stop signs. When you come to a stop sign in a vehicle, you're required to come to a full stop and assess the road before going your way. And even if there's absolutely no other cars around, you must stop. Yield signs predominantly mean to slow down. They're used as a warning sign that there may be something up ahead that requires you to slow down and be cautious of your surroundings. In such cases, the point is to slow down for cars or other people, defer to other cars and incoming traffic, proceed when safe, and stop when necessary. Yield signs mean we let other road users go first. We let the other driver take the right of way. Now, yield signs are to be followed, but somehow they can be easier to ignore. Like they're not as forceful as a stop sign because there actually is a lot of wiggle room because I've visited Dr. Google and I did some searching on the rules for yield signs. The law states that you should 
slow down to a reasonable speed when you approach a yield sign. Reasonable speed. That seems up for debate. <laughs> the law also states, after slowing or stopping, the driver shall yield the right of way to any vehicle in the intersection or approaching on another roadway so closely as to constitute an immediate hazard. Okay, how close is so closely as to constitute an immediate hazard? And then of course, there may be contention over really who has that right of way. I mean, who really should be deferred to, or, or actually who gets to determine it's safe to proceed? And is a distracted driver really the one that's in the best seat to do that? So yield signs involve a driver's ability to analyze and decide. Stop signs don't. Stop signs just say stop. That's keeping the law. Yield signs are figure out who has the right of way and yield. That's surrendering to grace. Because the yield sign appeals to the driver's will. <coughs> the will. The yield sign appeals to one's independent faculty of choice. The yield sign calls on the ability to exercise choice, intention, or decision. And the yield sign is analyzed in the act of choosing. And this is exactly where we're headed tonight. Paul has already drawn the distinction between the law, the stop sign, that tells us exactly what to do or what not to do. But the trouble is there's just too many of those things to obey them all. But the yield sign is aimed squarely at the act of choosing. And as we considered last week through faith in Christ, we've been granted his grace that works to set us free. And the fact is we can only yield if we have been set free. A slave cannot yield because yielding implies will. Slaves have no free will. They are bound to obey. We have been given the gift of freedom by his grace. And this is critical to think on in the application of Paul's writing. We cannot add anything to his work, to his grace that has saved us and set us free, but it is in this place of freedom that we're now free to choose. Because through faith in Christ, we're no longer a slave to sin, but we are now free to choose whom we will serve. Remember when we considered um, Paul referring to him as a bond slave or a bond servant in chapters um, one. We learned that a bond slave is one who has been set free but chooses to stay in service of his master. So then a bond slave is free but chooses to serve. Like Jesus, like Paul, and prayerfully like us. In Paul emphasizing that we are not saved by the law, he was in no way eradicating the moral law, the Ten Commandments, Christian apologetics, our reasoned defense of the faith, finds much strength in the moral law. The moral law argument demonstrates the fact that there is a universal moral law giver. Because no matter where you go, what culture you find yourself in, murder, stealing, taking another spouse, disrespecting your parents, is considered wrong. The laws that govern morality are universal and are to be followed because there is a universal moral law giver. But as we know, following laws does not necessarily lead to following God. But only, but we also know that laws are necessary for any society to function and not only function, but to thrive. But if we're not saved by the law, and we do not grow in our faith by the law, then what is to govern our behavior? As traffic laws are needed for safety and coexisting on the road, the law was given so that the children of God could coexist in the society of God. But the law could never grant them a safe arrival to eternity in heaven. Before the commands of the law came, Came his call to love. Remember Deuteronomy 10. Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, 
and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Love was what was to lead them in holy reverence and obedience. So then, their failure to obey God was the result of a love deficit. And through the law, they would also realize their utter failure to be able to keep the law and hopefully realize how utterly empty their heart was of love for God. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And the law was replaced by his grace that works. So we might say the stop sign was permanently and forever replaced by the yield sign. As a way of reminder last week, we saw that our new life in Christ, granted by grace through faith, sets us free to love. It was his heart for us from the beginning. And as we love him, we will love others, and it is in our love for others that the law will be fulfilled, as Paul wrote in Galatians 5.14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But we only love because he loved us first. 1 John 4, 19 says. He loved us first so that we could love him. Because before we can love others, there must be first love for God. But he did not leave us to ourselves in this. Oh no. In the fullness of time, he sent forth his son in the greatest act of love that he could ever demonstrate as he willingly gave his very life for us to set us free from the bondage of sin. Romans 6, 17, and 18. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And now we are free to choose to become his bond slave of righteousness. It was for this freedom from sin that he set us free. Freedom to love others because we've been set free to first and foremost love God. Not forced into his service, but freed from sin and so overwhelmingly grateful for such love that we respond in kind to become his bond slave. Walking in the freedom we now have to choose to yield to his Holy Spirit. His grace that works sets us free so that we're no longer a slave to sin, but we're free to choose to yield. Much like Paul said in Galatians 5, we through the Spirit by faith are waiting. That's a yielding. We're waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. And as we yield to his Spirit, we relinquish control to live by faith in the one who loves us unconditionally. This is just the greatest passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Because he so loved us and died for us, we've been set free to choose to live for him. And that is his grace that works as we yield to his spirit. In choosing to yield, we give God full right. All full right. Full right of way in our lives. So that his freedom, this freedom becomes reciprocal. As we walk in freedom and yield to his spirit, his spirit then has freedom to work in us by his grace. The freedom to have his way in us. And it is in his way that we will be set free from the dominating desires of the flesh. And now we get into tonight's study. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. This walking refers to a way of life, the way we conduct ourselves habitually. And this evening, we will see Paul make the clear distinction between the works of the flesh, the stop sign, and his grace that works as we yield to the spirit. A distinction that is clearly manifested in our habitual lifestyles. Listen to the way Oswald Chambers described it. The Sermon on the Mount is not a set of rules and regulations. 
It is a statement of the life we will live when the Holy Spirit is having his unhindered way in us. Paul is going to stress the point that it's not about stopping or the stop sign, but rather it's yielding. It's that if we, then we, reality. The choice is ours. If we yield to the Spirit, then we will allow him to have his unhindered way in us. His unhindered way. Sounds so nice. But as we all know, nice is not easy. Why? Because this life is a battle. It's exactly what Paul went on to say. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. That's war language. One being set against the other. Opponents in conflict. But this talk of war should not really be very surprising to us. I think we often tend to view spiritual warfare as somewhat of a mystical concept. As though it might be only for the super spiritual. However, though I don't always live like I believe it, I do truly believe, and I'm thoroughly convinced, that spiritual warfare is more real than anything we can see or touch with our eyes. Now, Paul wrote in Colossians, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where does this passage say we are? We're in the heavens, hidden with Christ in God. Christ seated at the right hand of God. That is our reality. And we're called to set our mind on things above. Because the reality, the real truth, we are to live in the spiritual realm with our minds fixed on the things above, seeking the things above, because our real beings, our utter and complete reality, now dwells there, hidden with Christ in God. And because we actually live in that realm, it goes without saying that the trials we encounter and endure are truly spiritual in their very essence. So we must choose to keep standing firm in our freedom as we keep seeking him above. And that's a choice that requires yielding. In Ephesians 6, the famous passage on spiritual warfare, Paul wrote, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Rather than giving in to the schemes of the enemy, those lies that our own ability is all that we need to walk in step with God, we are to yield to his strength and his might in order to stand firm and not be subject again to that yoke of slavery. Remember, it was for freedom Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. This is an act of spiritual warfare. But it is and always will be a struggle. And though the enemy is unseen, the battle occurs in areas we can see. And if we don't understand the true nature of the battle, we will attempt to fight it with our own strength. But if Paul went on to say in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness, where? In the, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. This passage continues through verses 14 through 18 to explicitly describe the full armor of God. And we don't have time to get into that this evening. But suffice it to say, his armor revolves around the truth of our salvation purchased for us through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. Standing firm in his truth is where we begin to get victory. And then as we yield to him, we allow him to have his unhindered way and thereby clothe us 
with the strength of his spirit. And Paul definitely does not call us to the law to stop doing the deeds of the flesh in order to gain the victory. But he calls us to yield and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It was about this place in my study when I got up and I went into the garage where John Mark was finishing a woodworking project. And I said, do you know how hard it is to teach on yielding to the Spirit when you don't even know how yourself? His reply, tell me about it. So one thing I have learned through preparing this study, it's a lifelong lesson, a lifelong journey, learning to yield. And I have so very much to learn. But coming back to our stop sign analogy, Paul did not hold up that stop sign and say, stop flesh, because denying the flesh in our own strength often leads us to do that insatiable desire, just because it was what we were told not to do. It's exactly what you talked about last week in small group, Rachel. And it's just like those wet paint signs, don't touch. And then what happens? Well, somehow we just can't help ourselves. Something in the flesh just goes into autopilot when the flesh is ordered to stop. And if you're a parent, you can totally relate to this. Whenever I see a sign that says don't touch, I make it my mission to touch it. <laughs> the flesh is on a mission. Rebel. So rather than depending on a stop sign to control the flesh, we're exhorted to yield to his grace because... If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. But there is a sort of rubric. If you're a teacher, does everybody know what a rubric is? It's a way that you can measure progress. There's a sort of rubric that outlines our journey in the faith, and that is our habitual lifestyles. Are we led more by the flesh or by the Spirit? Paul's writing about the works of the flesh in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit provide us with a spiritual diagnostic for self-examination. Now, none of us will get it right all the time. And truth be told, our failures can lead us to real discouragement. But yielding to the Spirit is stepping onto the battlefield as the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And it is not a battle that is won by our natural common sense. The battle will only be won by faith. In talking about the life of faith, Oswald Chambers, if you haven't figured out, is one of my favorites. He wrote, common sense and faith are as different from each other as the natural life is from the spiritual, and his impulsiveness is from inspiration. Nothing that Jesus Christ ever said is common sense, but is revelation sense. Revelation sense. That phrase just knocked me off my feet. And he, and revelation sense, and it is complete, whereas common sense falls short. The works of the flesh are driven by our natural senses, impulsive and uncontrolled. The fruit of the spirit is revealed, is revealed and is inspired through the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. And although the byproducts of the flesh could not be any more different than the fruit that is produced by the Spirit, both find their homes within the same three spheres of mankind. The inward, the upward, the outward. The works of the flesh begin with the inward. Of course they do, because the flesh is impulsive and uncontrolled. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, those are the inward sins that brew within the impulsive, uncontrolled sins. Next, the upward, who we idolize and worship, idolatry, sorcery. And the result is what manifests in our relationships, the outward. And there's a bunch. Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. The list Paul gave about the deeds of the flesh was certainly not an exhaustive list, for he included the phrase, and things like these. But these deeds do categorize the types of sin that the flesh so readily succumbs to. 
the inward sins within, the pure immorality, impurity, sensuality, the upward sin against God, idolatry and sorcery, and the outward sins against others, enmity, strife, and there's the list that goes on. Paul says these deeds are evident, and while we may be able to conceal some of our deeds of the flesh, they will always be evident before holy God. But lest we fool ourselves, they're very often glaringly evident before others as well. Why? Well, David Jeremiah points out. Oh, I skipped that. There was the breakdown. Sorry. There's your breakdown of inward, upward, and outward. But Jeremiah, David Jeremiah points out, notice that most of the works of the flesh are social sins, the outward sins. It is in our personal relationship that the flesh most often appears. Have you ever had an absolutely precious time with the Lord? It's been so sweet. And then you get up, and the next thing you know, you run into some idiot on the road or in the <laughs> checkout. <laughs> Yes, imperfect people create the perfect environment for the flesh to raise its ugly head. But let's not forget, we also fall into that category of imperfect people. Whether our sins are private or public, whether our sins are against others or against holy God, they are works of the flesh. And perhaps Paul was telling us these things. Okay, sorry. Perhaps, Lord, I just rebuke that in me. Um, perhaps Paul is telling us these things that should be evident to us because if these things are our habitual practice Paul said we, can't, we cannot count ourselves in the family of God of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God now this is not to say that we either earn or lose our way into his kingdom but if we are in him, then the Bible says we are new creations in him. And by his grace that works, the old has passed away. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17. But if our default mode, if our habitual lifestyle is the old, and the flesh is still ruling and having its way in us, and if the new things are not evident, then it just might well be time for a checkup. It is never a bad thing to examine ourselves, to see if we are in the faith. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? Do you recognize Jesus Christ is in you? That's the examination. That is the test. Because if Christ is in us, if he is living his life through us, then it will be the attributes of Christ that he lives through us. And the contrast is glaring. The works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit, as Warren Wiersbe so eloquently stated, the contrast between works and fruit is important. A machine in a factory works and turns out a product, but it can never manufacture fruit. Fruit must grow out of life. And in the case of the believer, it is the life of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit grows as it finds its origination in the upward, in the very nature of God. Because as we have heard since the dawn of creation, fruit will bear fruit after its kind. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. So the fruit that God brings bear in the life of his children is after his kind. We cannot manufacture the fruit of the Spirit any more than a machine can. But as we yield to the Spirit, his grace that works will grow us and will grow in us his fruit after his kind. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Most Bible scholars agree that Paul began with love, as all the other fruit is really an outgrowth of his love. It is his love that both fulfills the law and, perform, and forms Christ in us. And remember, the children of Israel failed in their obedience. Why? Because of a love deficit. Agape love, divine love, selfless, unconditional love, 
is the complete antithesis to natural love. I've also heard it taught, and that the fruit of the Spirit is a singular term. Paul did not write about the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit. And as we yield to the Spirit and He forms Christ in us, every part of us will grow in our family resemblance because the fruit of the Spirit is Christ's collective character being formed in us. This, the encapsulated description of the fruit of the Spirit where you, that you're going to hear and see on the screen, they are a combination of notes taken from the NIV study Bible, from David Jeremiah's study Bible, and from Strong's exhaustive concordance. So I don't want you to think that I came up with any of this by myself. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that bears fruit after its kind, bears fruit that manifests in those same three spheres. Except unlike the flesh that begins with the inward, the fruit of the Spirit always finds its inception first in the upward. Love, joy, peace. That can never be manufactured. This is the fruit of Christ's very character formed in us. Love. The sacrificial unmerited deeds to help a needy person. I want you to think about Jesus when we go through these. And see how he fits the de definition of everyone. Love is the power that moves us to respond to someone's needs with no expectation of reward. Joy and inner happiness are not dependent on outward circumstances. Joy differs from happiness which relies on favorable conditions. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For God so loved the world. Peace, harmony in all relations. Both the supernatural calm and chaos, calm amid chaos, and the ability to bring harmony to divided factions. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. Then Paul describes the outward fruit. Fruit that transforms our interactions with others. Patience, kindness, goodness. Again, think about Jesus. Patience, putting up with others. Does he ever have to put up with you? <laughs> sure does he. Even when one is severely tried. The quiet willingness to accept irritating or painful situations. Kindness, doing thoughtful deeds for others. Generosity in consideration towards others. Goodness, the inherent, inherent propensity to show generosity to others and shows itself in moral excellence. And then the inward, fruit that transforms our inner selves, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Faithfulness talks about trustworthiness and reliability, enduring loyalty and trustworthiness. Gentleness, the power to control your reactions to difficult people and situations. It should not be confused with weakness. And self-control, victory over sinful desires. The ability to restrain inappropriate passions and appetites. The fruit of the Spirit perfectly manifests in Jesus. Fulfilling the law through his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and is imparted to us by grace. Now, if you're like me, that seems like a very tall order. Impossible, you might even say. But as we yield to his spirit, he then has his way in us as the flesh takes its rightful place on the cross. Paul wrote, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. But crucifixion is a death we cannot inflict upon ourselves. We cannot nail ourselves or strap ourselves to a cross, then lift it up and lower it into the ground. It is absolutely an impossibility to crucify ourselves. The Bible teaches that we were crucified with him in Romans 6. I talked about that before, but read Romans 6, 1 through 11. We, this we address back in our study in chapter 2, as we consider his grace that works through the exchange life. And the Bible teaches that it is as we count our co-crucifixion our co to be true, 
To reckon it as so, it is then the crucifying of our flesh with its passions and desires is realized. We do not crucify our flesh. We simply, by faith, yield to his spirit and reckon it to be so. Our reckoning does not make it true. It already is true. Our reckoning simply makes us begin to realize the fact in experience. James R. McConkie. We will begin to realize that our flesh, with its passions and desires, has been crucified in our experience as we reckon our co-crucifixion with Christ to be true. As Paul wrote, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And as all that his death has accomplished for us is realized in our lives, his grace that works as we yield to his spirit makes his abode in us to live his life through us. That the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the one who so loved us that he gave his life for us. Oswald Chambers commented this on Galatians 2.20. The inescapable spiritual need each of us has is the need to sign the death certificate of our sin nature. I must take my emotional opinions and intellectual beliefs and be will willing to turn them into a moral verdict against the nature of sin. That is against any claim I have to my right to myself. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. There is that will, the yielding. I must be willing to make them a moral verdict against the nature of sin. We're to live by faith. And as, as Oswald Chambers said, we're to live by revelation sense. And as we believe the inspired revelation of his word, and we reckon it as true, and we sign the death certificate of our sin nature, and yield to the leading of his Holy Spirit, we will not be governed by the desires of the flesh. We began this evening in our study that said, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And as we said earlier, this word walk refers to a way of life, an habitual conduct. But now in 525, Paul says this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Two different Greek verbs. Here, this verb to walk in Greek means to walk so as to keep in step with, to not run ahead or lag behind. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is yielding. If we are to live in the Spirit, then we are to keep in step with Him, not trying to be in control by getting ahead of Him, and not getting behind and having to drug in our obstinate disobedience. Walking by the Spirit is a willingness to keep in step with him as we yield to his spirit. And on this we can rest. His grace will always work as we yield to the spirit and willingly keep in step with him. Oswald Chambers was quoted as saying, the statement we so often hear, make a decision for Jesus Christ, places the emphasis on something our Lord never trusted. Think about that. He never asks us, to decide for him, but to yield to him. Something very different. And Paul ends this contrast of the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit with a final diagnostic barometer. Are we in fact emphasizing what Jesus asks of us? To yield to him. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And we're reminded again what David Jeremiah said. It's in our personal relationships that the flesh most often appears. But when we yield and we're in step with his spirit, rather than manufacturing the works of the flesh in our relationships, his grace that works will manifest the fruit of his spirit. And we must never forget it. Fruit is never grown just to be put on display. Fruit is meant to be eaten and not just amongst ourselves. We're called to bear fruit 
that we might feed others with the life-giving sustenance of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, tall order. But we don't decide to do it. And God did not hold up the stop sign and say, stop doing the deeds of the flesh so that you can do this. Because that just invites the flesh to go on a mission to rebel and do what we're told not to do. Like I said, tonight was a lot to take in. And I pray we will all continue digging and seeking. Because the truth is, there's no person, no person that can teach us how to yield to his spirit. But Jesus said, if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, we'll receive, we will find, and he will open the door. And that's grace. God does not force us. He invites us to trust his grace that works as we yield to his Holy Spirit to grow fruit that will bring sustenance to others and bring glory to the only one who is able and worthy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next week we will begin the first of the last two sessions. It will be in Galatians 6, 1 through 10. So be prayerfully um, reading and studying. I also want to remind you that first and foremost, joining with our um, Nueva Vida, our Hispanic congregation, will meet in here on Sunday at 4.30 to pray and enjoy and experience communion together. So I pray that you will make that out. Let's pray before you all get introduced, get, go to your small groups. And I know this was a lot. Thank you for your patience with all the stuff. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your grace. And Lord, right now we confess that we don't know really how, and we also confess that there's no one that can teach us how, but you. And you do more than teach. You impart. You, you give your life in us that we might live the fruit of the Spirit. So, Lord, I pray, God, you continue working in us with such a desire. Lord, please make us mindful that we would be always ready to examine ourselves. Make sure that we are your child and then examine what we are giving ourselves over to more, the flesh or your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're desperate for you. We need you. So we thank you, God, for being so gracious to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies.